to everyone for the uh, continuation of our class on Romans. <clears throat> we uh, stopped last time at the seventh verse of chapter three, so we'll begin with the eighth verse of chapter three. Before we do, though, let's have a uh, short order of prayer. Would you bow with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we are grateful for this study of thy word. <clears throat> For the truths contained therein, we pray, Father, that our study may not only be during this class, but privately as we learn the great truths that are, that are contained therein. Bless us in our studies and bless those who come to knowledge of thy truths, and particularly those who obey thy truths. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> It uh, says there in verse 8, and why not say, let us do evil that good may, that good may come, <clears throat> as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. <clears throat> well, this is a further refutation of the reasoning of verse 5. <clears throat> if the notion stated in the uh, objection were correct, then the more we sin, the, the better it will be for us. It is a uh, palpable absurdity. Now, apparently, uh, some were slandering Paul by ascribing to him this false notion and affirming that he said it. <clears throat> that would be to, be to say they, whoever they are had uh, firsthand knowledge of him as having so stated, but they didn't <clears throat> because he never stated it. <clears throat> In verse nine, he says, uh, what then are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. All were under sin. The Jew was not any better than the Gentile or vice versa. Whatever greater privileges and advantages the Jew may have had from possession of the oracles of God had been forfeited uh, because of their sins. <clears throat> Paul goes on to write in verse 10, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And uh, that's from the uh, 14th Psalm, verse 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. <clears throat> um, they are corrupt. They have done abominable works. And there is none who does good. It was uh, conceded by Paul and the, and the Jews that the Gentiles were guilty of sin. <clears throat> uh, that was agreed upon. The Jew did not concede, however, that they were as guilty as the Gentiles. That was a foreign concept to them. None were absolutely justified simply because of their ethnic background. <clears throat> the Jews might uh, perhaps object to what Paul was saying, but they could not refute what their own scriptures said. If it is true, and it is because their scriptures said it was, if it is true that none are righteous in an absolute sense, <clears throat> well, you know, they're, they're good Jews and bad Jews, and that goes out saying, but none were wholly free from sin, uh, which is the uh, point being made. So the none are righteous in an absolute sense, uh, if that's the case, then that includes the Jew as well as the Gentile. And if all are under sin, Jew and Gentile, what is the basis for the Jew to boast? <clears throat> well, there's no basis. In verse 11, <clears throat> there is none who understands. <clears throat> There is none who seeks after God. And that comes from 
14th Psalm, verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. The greatest honor and privilege of a righteous man is to know God and to understand his will. Certainly there are those who have a, a deep understanding of God's will, but no one has a perfect knowledge of God's purposes or a full appreciation of his goodness. <clears throat> there is always room for growth. Uh, the Jew did not view his knowledge as lacking in fullness. And as a result of their understanding of divine things grew blunt. They had revelations from God, but misinterpreted it, and misinterpreted and misapplied them. In Luke, the 11th chapter, verse 52, <clears throat> there's a warning to the lawyers. Woe to you, lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter in yourselves, and those who were entering in you hindered. They did not seek the favor of God. <clears throat> and in Luke 16, chapter verse 15, and uh, he, Jesus, said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. <clears throat> Why did they justify themselves before men? When we read in John, the 12th chapter, verse 43, for they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. <clears throat> In verse 12 of chapter 3, for they have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. In Psalm, the, the 14th Psalm, verse 3, they have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. For the ones Paul are speaking of, their understandings had uh, become darkened. And consequently, they turned away from the path that seeks the favor of God. So in the, in the service of God, they became useless. <clears throat> in Revelation, the third chapter, verse 16, we read, So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. When Paul writes that there are none to, uh, who do good, that is not to say that no one does any good at all. But it is to say that there are none who are absolutely good. All are sinners. Therefore, Jew and Gentile are equal before God in that both need a Savior. <clears throat> in verse 13 of uh, chapter 3, it says their throat is an open tomb. With their tongue they have practiced deceit. The poison of ash is under their lips. <clears throat> now that comes from uh, the fifth Psalm, verse 9, for there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. And in the 140th Psalm, verse 3, they sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asp is under their lips. <clears throat> An open tomb that, uh, that is uh, one in which a body has been placed is a, a natural situation. Uh, tombs, once they have been occupied, so to speak, they're normally closed up. And even today, once a casket is lowered in the ground, it's covered up. In that era, an open tomb was uh, uh, it consequentially emit foul, foul odors. <clears throat> so they can only practice what is in their heart. If they deceive with their tongues, it is merely a reflection of what is in their heart. 
here Paul is saying, <clears throat> not only is it in their heart to deceive, but they have uh, refined it by practice to an art. What such lips say is to, to the is to the reputation as a venom venom of an asp is to his victim. In verse uh, 14 of chapter 3, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. <clears throat> Again, we read from the uh, Psalms, 10th Psalm, verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. The mouth uh, which God created to praise God is here used for grieving. Of course, what uh, proceeds out of the mouth is but a reflection of what is in the heart. We read in Matthew, the 15th chapter, verse uh, 18, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. <clears throat> and uh, Luke, the 6th chapter, verse 45, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart uh, brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. A curse, uh, just to give a de definition, is an implication which deity was expected to execute. And, <clears throat> and when we do that, we're saying, deity, you have to do this. He was to wish evil upon someone and expect God to carry it out. <clears throat> uh, bitterness is uh, a credity that leaves a bad taste in the mouth. And we've all eaten some something that was accurate and it didn't taste very good. So it leaves a bad taste in the mouth. It is extreme wickedness. It's uh, highly offensive to God and, and all good men. It's a hurtful and destructive to others, either by design or consequentially. <clears throat> In the 15th verse of Romans 3, it says, Their feet, feet are swift to shed blood. Now, this and the uh, next three verses are from uh, Isaiah 59, verses 7 through 8. I'll just read it here. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. They are uh, disposed to commit murder, and we'll do so swiftly and without compunction. <clears throat> in the 16th verse, uh, destruction and misery are in their ways. So wherever they go, they destroy reputation, life, or something else held dear by their victim. They sow misery in their wake. Now, worst of all, they seek the ruin of souls. In verse 17, it says, in the way of peace, they have not known. It is not that they could have known peace. <clears throat> they chose not to pursue the way of peace. Discord and strife are their stock and trade. As a matter of fact, they delight in it. If they do not have peace, they seek to deny it to others. This is the uh, ultimate manifestation of an evil heart. In verse 18, it says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. <clears throat> In Psalm, the 36th Psalm, verse 1, it says, an oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked, there is no fear of God before his eyes. They are not motivated by any regard to the will or displeasure of God. It's been the case, it's no wonder that the preceding catalog of vices are 
present. Where God is not feared, neither is anything else. Uh, fear of God is a barrier to sin. So the preceding three verses, while not exhaustive or universal, show that the Jews own scripture prove that they are as sinful as the Gentiles. In doing so, Paul has proved his charge that both Jew and Gentiles are equally under sin. So in this regard, neither is superior to the other, and the Jew has no basis or room to boast. <clears throat> or for that fact, neither does a Gentile. <clears throat> Uh, the 19th verse of chapter 3. <clears throat> now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law. And that uh, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. <clears throat> all know and or should know and uh, would admit or should admit that whatever the law, that's any law, says, it says to those that are under it. Paul here is speaking of the law of Moses, but it applies to any law. The Jew cannot make any argument to defend his violation of the law. Therefore, essentially, his mouth is stopped from offering a baseless defense. But this is the case for the Gentile as well. Thus, uh, all are guilty before God. In the verse uh, 20 of chapter 3. <clears throat> Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. <clears throat> I should say that, uh, you know, it says uh, the deeds of the law. The in that phrase uh, is only assumed by the translators. It uh, should say by the deeds of law, a law system. <clears throat> law operates by two methods, any law. <clears throat> it uh, commands what is right and it uh, prohibits what is wrong. And you might see that uh, in the prohibition, there must be a, a penalty for, pro, uh, for violating that uh, law. So law produces an awareness of or, or a knowledge of sin. <clears throat> but if broken, the only thing law, now just keep in mind, we're talking about a pure law system. The only thing that law can do is condemn the transgression. So it takes the uh, gospel plan of salvation, that is the blood of Christ, uh, to justify the sinner in the sight of God. So that's the grace of God. <clears throat> in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God. Apart from the law. Is revealed. Being witnessed by the law. And the prophets. By the works of the law. No one can be justified. By law system. So that, you know, what the Jew should have understood from all the years under the law of Moses, there had to be another way. If it is to be attained, attained, it must be a system that is not a pure law system. <clears throat> uh, God's righteousness is revealed in his plan of justifying a man apart from the law of Moses. <clears throat> and that plan is revealed in the uh, gospel of Christ. In verse uh, 22 of chapter 3, which is a continuation 21, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. The righteousness of God apart from the law is through faith in uh, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> It is available to all and on all who believe in the Christ and render obedience to the gospel. 
It is, it is not a condition of merit, but of grace and mercy. The Jew held a tribal view of God, if you will. God belonged to them. But Paul says that there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. <clears throat> Why? Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of, of God. As uh, Paul has often stated, Jew and Gentile alike have sinned. Glory is the honor that is due God and sinning caused one to fall short of that. In 2 Corinthians 4th chapter verse 6, it reads there, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give light, give the light of knowledge to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's where it is. <clears throat> verse 24 is a, still a continuation, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now being justified is to be pronounced not guilty uh, by the one having the authority to condemn. Therefore, we are justified freely by his grace, that, that is his unmerited favor, uh, that is by gratuitous, gratuitous bestowal of a needed thing, namely redemption. That cannot be bought, but in this case, is purchased by another, Christ Jesus. <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 20, he said, For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. <clears throat> in Titus, the 2nd chapter, verse 14, he says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people zealous for good works. And in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 30, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. <clears throat> So that redemption is in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> in verse uh, 25 of uh, chapter 3, still a continuation of the same uh, sentence, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. <clears throat> Uh, Jesus was set forth, that, that is, uh, placed out before the world to be noticed. And the Greek word translated propitiation is used in the Septuagint to identify the mercy seat upon which the high priest, once a year, sprinkled the blood of the sin offering and so made an atonement for the sins of the people. Christ is now that mercy seat and he sprinkled it with his own blood. It is that blood of Christ that was shed on the cross that propitiates, expiates, and atones for our sins. All have sinned. <clears throat> In the civil or criminal law, it's uh, imperative that lawbreakers be punished or otherwise held accountable. If this principle is ignored or enforced uh, only on the unfavored, then society breaks down. It is no less true of the spiritual realm. Violators must pay the penalty for violating the law of heaven. Christ is that propitiation in that he has paid the penalty by his own blood. <clears throat> and that payment is secured by the sinner by the obedience of faith. <clears throat> Uh, during the time of patriarchy, patriarchy and Moses, sins were not fully and finally forgiven. The blood of animals could not wash away sin, but it was only a reminder that it took blood to expiate sin. 
the typical blood of those two covenants did not make them perfect as to the conscience. Uh, it was a partial and temporary cleansing from sin. In the Day of Atonement, it had to be done all over again. It took the blood of a sinless man to effect the ultimate washing away of sins. With respect to the faithful who died before Christ went to the cross, his blood had a retrospective efficacy. Those of old, such as Abraham, believed God and obeyed him. Now, obedience perfects belief. They had been done, their sins were washed away by the prospectively shed blood of Christ. And our sins are washed away by the respectively, retrospectively shed blood of Christ. It is, however, the same blood, the same shedding in both cases. In Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 13 through 15, uh, we read there, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason, he is a mediator of the new covenant by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the internal, eternal inheritance. <clears throat> In verse uh, 26 of Romans chapter 3, again, it's a continuation, same sentence. So to demonstrate uh, the King James Version that is declare, and the ASV has uh, for the showing, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. The present time is the time of Christ or the uh, Christian age. The death of Christ made it possible for God to be righteous in passing over the sins previously committed before the coming of Christ, since all these prior sacrifices were temporary and pointed uh, to the permanent, that is, Christ himself. He set forth Christ as that eternal sacrifice is proved that he is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In verse 27, chapter 3, now we begin a new sentence. Where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? You know, by what law uh, is excluded, boasting excluded? The works? No. But by the law of faith. <clears throat> So on what basis may man boast, uh, whether it's the Jew or the Gentile? There's no basis, since uh, man may not, by his own works, merit salvation. But what law excludes the boasting? Is it the law of the Jew, which must be kept perfectly? Well, the same goes for the Gentile. It's neither. It's based on the law of faith that is the gospel. Justification is by belief in Christ and obedience to his gospel. That is the law of faith. Its foundation is God's favor and mercy. Its reason uh, or, or its implementing force, if you will, is a ransom of mankind by the sacrifice of Christ. On that basis, no one can boast from uh, the uh, perspective of merit. In the 28th verse of chapter 3, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. <clears throat> Paul concludes that boasting is excluded by the law of belief. It was over this passage that Martin Luther translated justified by faith only. Only is not in the Greek text. 
it was uh, merely an extension of his aversion to the papal tenet of justification by works. His doctrine of justification by faith only is just as dangerous to the salvation of man as is the Roman Catholic proclamation of justification by works. Both of them are error. It is an obedient faith that saves, faith in the atoning blood of Christ. It cannot be merited. It is not a halfway position between the Lutheran and the Romish doctrines. It is the truth and the only truth. We should not conclude that the law is unimportant simply based on Paul's assertion that we are justified apart from the deeds of the law. Verse does not say that we are not obligated to keep the law under which we serve. We must keep the entire law to be justified by it. The law itself is not worthless for it comes from God. It is the fact that we do not keep all of it and therefore it condemns. It takes the gospel to overcome our disobedience to law. <clears throat> In verse 29 of chapter 3, or is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Well, God is the God of all Jew and Gentile. All have sinned against him, and he will justify all in the same way. Of course, this is a rhetorical question, which the Jew had to answer exactly this. He's the God of everyone. Yeah. In verse 30, a continuation of uh, verse 29. Uh, <clears throat> yes, of the Gentiles also, since there is one God who will just the circumcised by faith and the circumcised through faith. <clears throat> the by, the word by in by faith justification, that justification is uh, conceived of arising out of belief as a source. Whereas the through in through faith justification is seen as being accomplished by the mechanism of belief. So they, they just give a different aspect to uh, <clears throat> how that is accomplished. In verse 31, do we then make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish the law. <clears throat> if uh, justification by law is impossible, and if justification is attainable only through faith, is law rendered useless and unnecessary? Uh, this question anticipated by Paul is really a non sequitur. Law may be wholly useless for one purpose and yet essential for another. <clears throat> law is of no service as a means of justification. Yet it serves other important purposes. <clears throat> Therefore, the strong answer, uh, King James may have God forbid, but here it says certainly not. That's a very emphatic answer. But law is not rendered useless by belief. <clears throat> so who establishes law? <clears throat> Paul and others who are teaching, preaching, and practicing the gospel of Christ. Uh, that's who establishes law. <clears throat> by doing so, they teach men to do what is right and abstain from doing what is wrong. Uh, that is the purpose for which law was established. <clears throat> Going on into chapter 4, <clears throat> uh, verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, is found according to the flesh? Now, if Paul concluded that man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, um, meaning that this has always been the case for all men everywhere, he here puts the notion to the test from the Greek word translated uh, has found 
uh, we get the English word heuristic, uh, which is a method that allows one to solve uh, problems. Use that in math a lot <clears throat> and make judgments quickly and efficiently. Also, the tense is Greek present, which is something that has happened, but the result is uh, continuing. It's an ongoing uh, uh, happening or event. <clears throat> so the verse could be worded that Abraham, our father, found uh, something according to the flesh, or rather we say he found something. And now, what did he find? <clears throat> In uh, verse uh, 2, it says, For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about but not before God. Had Abraham obtained justification by works, then he could have boasted of that accomplishment. But he was saved by faith. Therefore, he has no grounds to boast before God or anyone else. <clears throat> what do, <clears throat> does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him or put to his account for righteousness. This comes from Genesis, the 15th chapter, verses 5 and 6. Then he brought him, uh, Abraham, outside and said, <clears throat> Look now towards heaven and count the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he, Abraham, believed in the Lord. And he, God, the Lord, accounted it to him for righteousness. In Hebrews, the uh, <clears throat> 11th chapter, verse 8, says there, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place uh, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. <clears throat> now, the things that God pointed out to Abraham were, were uh, subject to skepticism by the average person. But Abraham believed what God told him, and he acted on that belief. It is not said that Abraham had all the details of how God's promise was to be effected, or that his belief was elucidated miraculously. He believed in the common way we believe anything, the only difference being the things he believed. <clears throat> if he considered what God promised only in the abstract, then his belief was uh, useless. God's promise to Abraham was not a theoretical, theoretical construct, but it was as real to Abraham as if it had already happened. <clears throat> now, what was the result of uh, Abraham's belief? God accounted something to Abraham. So what does accounted mean? Of course, you know that's an accounting term. <laughs> As one might guess, it was uh, has its basis in accounting or commerce. <clears throat> it carries the idea of something being put to one's credit or included in their inventory, say. So because of Abraham's belief, he was credited with righteousness or justification, if you will. It was because of the it that righteousness was credited to him. The it was his belief on or in the promises of God upon which he acted. That constituted his righteousness or justification. The far comes from the Greek word uh, ice, as in for the remission of sins. Uh, that is the act of baptism attained for the obedient, uh, obedient belief. Uh, remission of sins, Acts 2.38. <clears throat> the meaning then is this. <clears throat> Abraham believed the promises of God and because of such belief, it was put to his credit that he obtained a justification. There is there a, an apparent uh, discrepancy between what Paul says here and, and following and what James said? 
No, well, no. James wrote the following from James, second chapter, verses 20 and 24. But what do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? <clears throat> Do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which uh, says, Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Only is important. The deeds that James speak of are about the deeds of a believer. And our acts of obedient, obedience. Uh, James mentioned some specific acts of obedience by Abraham that demonstrated his faith. <clears throat> he does not say that Abraham kept works perfectly, but only that uh, faith and works must labor together. James concedes that man is justified by faith, but he denies that man is justified by faith only where he says that the two must work together. The work, works that James speak, uh, speaks of are not works of merit, or, but are the emanations of a saving faith. Uh, these points being the case, we may say that uh, justific justification by faith only to the exclusion of all other conditions contradicts the word of God. Furthermore, James has joined faith with certain acts as joint conditions of justification. So when Paul says that we are justified by faith, having never said by faith only, then he must be construed as including acts of obedience, which are not acts of merit. James includes them, and Paul does not exclude them. In both instances, it is by faith with acts of obedience, and neither is it faith is it faith with no acts of obedience. And we are at the uh, bottom of the hour, so rather than continuing on, which may take some time, we'll conclude here and begin with verse four uh, next week. <clears throat>